There was the one piano in this house, and as soon as class was finished, there would be a scramble uh, to occupy it. You could sometimes reserve it, but often it was just a free for all. So I used to crawl through the food hatch sometimes to see if I could beat the others. Peter and I, in particular, used to play together. We used to play old soul numbers in the main, Otis Redding stuff, uh, Wilson Pickett, things like Benny King. And uh, I don't know, he, I always thought Pete had a great voice for that kind of material. I mean, he always wanted to play the piano as well, actually, you know, but I managed to get there first, so I did that. Am I very wrong to hide behind the glare from an open mind and stare? And there was a strange character called Peter Gabriel, who, who was a very placid, very, very ordinary, very quite normal chap who would just suddenly jump on tables and start singing, which is quite out of character. He was a drummer, in fact, to start with. People don't realise this, but um, in fact, he lent the anon of our first... Uh, he, he used to let us borrow his drums, and he used to come along and look extremely nervous. My drums were my pride and joy, you know, when I was a teenager. It's very strange, because the, uh, the bass drum from that kit... Um, I've just pulled out again, and it's a small bass drum. It has a really uh, great, very hip sound. I was banned from playing the guitar throughout my entire career there. I'm not quite sure why. I guess maybe at that stage, pop music was a sort of a, a symbol for the revolution that was about to overthrow the establishment and bring the country down. <laughs> kind of two camps actually me and Ant and Tony and Peter and we were in rival groups at one point remember that we were called the Anon Tony and Peter had a group called the Garden Wall who were a bit jazzy and I thought were well, not really kind of rock and roll they were, they were very they appeared a little bit twee to me and Jonathan King was an old boy at the school and one day on the old boys day he, he tended to like to turn up so we we just thrust a tape on him as I got into Cambridge, I started succeeding in music. So I returned here after my first year at Cambridge with a number one hit under my belt and was approached by this little sprout who I'd never seen before because he never mixed with anyone like a year or two younger than me. And he gave me this tape, so I said, who's it by? And he said, oh, but I haven't got a name yet. So I listened to it foolishly, which I was a mistake I would never make in, in these advanced years, and thought it was absolutely fabulous because I thought the guy had a great lead voice and there were really interesting songs. So I named them Genesis, recorded them, and I can really, I might as well leave now. We got more and more involved in doing sort of slightly what you might call more typical later Genesis stuff. Um, but he wasn't really into that, and we realised we were losing him. So Peter and I very specifically sat down one day and wrote a song, Taylor made to Jonathan King's Tastes, and uh, his favourite group at the time were the Bee Gees, so we wrote a sort of Bee Gee pastiche song, you know, which was called The Silent Sun, and, uh, and he loved it. The silent sun that never shines She is the warmth of my lonely heart So I did my best uh, Robin Gibb impersonation on one of the demo tapes, and that allowed us through to the next leg, where we thought we could get into the uh, studio. It was also exciting at, at that point, and I remember when we first saw an ad in the record mirror for Silent Sun, um, you know, I cut it out and stuck it on my school books. It was a, you know, a big moment. Baby, you changed my life. I'm trying to show you. I still believe that some of those early songs could be smash hits. The Silent Sun particularly is a gorgeous song. A lot of people in those days said it was a bit of a Bee Gees pastiche. Actually, that's totally wrong because it was really before the Bee Gees and before the Crosby, Stills and Nash thing that they were doing this kind of sound. And I also think Peter's voice was so individual and the lyrics were so different from anything that anyone else was writing. I think if somebody else picked up some of those songs and covered them, they'd have smash hits. They are available through John Joe Music, her phone number at your local BBC station. We needed a name for The Silent Sun, we wanted to put it out as a single. No one had a, had a good idea. Between ourselves, we couldn't agree. One comes to, to come to mind, which in fact was one of Ant's ideas, which I think tells us a little about the era, which was the Champagne Meadow, I remember that. So I'm very glad that that wasn't it. I think I've got a, a soft spot for Jonathan, I think, because looking back, I mean, 
to make a, a few record now, a single or a few tracks is not a big deal. In those days, to make an album for a, a bunch of guys who were at school, sort of 16, 15, 16, 17, and, and couldn't really play very well, to go in and get a record deal, you know, three days to make the album, was, was actually quite an achievement. I had this brilliant idea to call it from Genesis to Revelation and not have an artist's name on it. This was a terrible mistake because it got bumped in, in all the religious bin of all the record shops and nobody ever heard it. I think a lot of his, his influence was good. I mean, there's no doubt that some of the tracks we were doing were uh, unwieldy and too naive. But nevertheless, I think that he wanted to turn us into too much of a poppy outfit. In 1970, Genesis signed to Tony Stratton Smith's Charisma Records. He paid the band a wage of £10 per week and took a very close interest in their career, encouraging Genesis to develop a live act. Tell me my life is about to begin, tell me that I'm a hero. By the time we came round to doing Trespass, uh, the second album, we'd done a certain amount of live playing and we'd, you know, we'd written loads and loads of material and the whole idea of the band had completely transformed from being a band that was trying to have a hit single to a band that was trying to do something adventurous musically. I started getting um, bad stage fright, which sort of came from nowhere, really. I mean, I started off by being pretty confident. In fact, at the start, Peter was the one that used to be uh, really quite... I mean, it seems extraordinary to think at one stage that um, one of the roadies was going to have to do the announcements because Pete just couldn't handle it at the beginning. Eventually, I got physically sick. I got bronchial pneumonia. The doctor advised me to, to, to clear out. We thought that if one of us left, we couldn't carry on. And uh, I reckon the closest we came to, to busting up was when Anthony left. I did suggest at the time that we looked for a new drummer because I thought it was important that we ought to um, try and get a drummer who was kind of of equal stature. We're waiting for you. Come and join us now. We need you with us. Come and join us now. Remember the first time you met Phil, and what was he like? Very, co very. Uh, you were going to say cocky, weren't you? He was cocky. So confident, confident. I thought this was, a, you know, this is not what I'm used to. I've never been anywhere like this before. And because they had the piano, grand piano, out on the patio, there was a sunshade for you to put your drums underneath. There was a swimming pool, and I was early as usual. And uh, one of the guys said, "Why don't you just go and have a swim? Well, we've got ten guys ahead of you, so why don't you just go and have a swim?" So I went and had a swim. Meanwhile, I was listening to all the other guys audition because it was open air, it was in the back garden. So by the time I came out and did my bit, I knew all the pieces, you know, I knew all the audition pieces. And I waltzed through it. Where he sat down at the kit, uh, I knew he was a good drummer before he played a note. I must admit, I'm... Flattery. But no, I mean, there was, you know, I think little doubt at the end of that session that, that Phil was the best. I mean, certainly Peter and I felt that. And, um... The rest, the rest, was, so <laughs> the, the rest was so terrible. Split decision. <laughs> When I joined the band, I was kind of the only one that had a, a that didn't have a public school education. I was a grammar school boy, actually stage school really. I mean, I, I stopped going to grammar school when I was 14 and went to stage school. Dad, you said I could have a cow of my own. Can I have this one? Oh, now hold on! I'm in one of our herd. You said I could choose. Yes, you did. That's right, Dad. So I was kind of class clown, and I, and I, when I joined the band, there was an awful lot of friction that I guess came from the background that the guys had. Found himself 
began to fail He saw a shimmering lake I must have spent a fortune on these one and sixpenny ads, you know, so um, I stuck one in that said um, guitarist writer seeks receptive musicians determined to strive beyond existing stagnant music forms and I thought well if that doesn't ring a bell with somebody you know I mean at least I'll get someone who's idealistic even if they're completely bonkers <laughs> Something in the wording of it that uh, made me curious. You know, a lot of the other guitarists we were coming across were into notes and flash and all that stuff. And Steve was into atmospheres, and that's uh, what attracted us. I felt, you know, the kind of delicate pastel shading acoustic aspect that the band did was very, very good. But then when the band was supposed to sort of rise into an area of some power. I felt that that was an area that I warmed to, the fact that, you know, um, there was some aggression in uh, my, my playing that I felt I could put that stamp on it in a way. <laughs> In 1971, the musically ambitious nursery crime was released. It was greeted with indifference by the music press and the public, and Genesis had to accept second best as their stablemates Lindisfarne had a number one hit with Fog on the Tyne. But unexpectedly, nursery crime entered the Italian top ten, forging a special relationship between Genesis and their Italian fans that has stretched to this day. At the time, the album didn't sell particularly well, so it's only in retrospect, or it's only as an archive item that it became um, a heavy seller, apart from one uh, territory, which was Italy. Well, you folks with that one. We like audiences that uh, sit down and listen to the music rather than uh, get drunk and pick up girls and... Uh, Big ones. Big ones. Bogu de Casina. Kazuna. Kazuki. We like audiences that sit down and listen to us. And we like the words, the music, the arrangements, all democratic. Oh, yes, oh, yes, that's right. Yes, uh, uh, quite often. About <laughs> five, six, or ten times a week. And in those days, no one really liked us, apart from the Italians, so the more time we could spend there, the better. The more we were cheered up. Fantasy, I think. Uh, where do you think uh, the inspiration... Dove trovate l'ispirazione per i vostri testi? Quasi sempre l'ispirazione ci viene dall'anima. So what we do is we, we check out the, uh, the reading of the song. Di qui, dalla lettura dell'anima che ascoltiamo con un orecchio. 1972 witnessed a turning point in the band's fortunes. Peter Gabriel's bizarre interest in mime and theatrical spectacle was beginning to give Genesis a distinctiveness missing in their earlier years. I mean, there was some encouragement in the early days. There was a few people who liked us, you know, as I say. And um, 
I think really what we were able to bypass a little bit, the fact that we weren't critically very well received by the fact that um, I think Peter and his costumes and stuff started to get us a bit of attention, you know, um, when you first put on these sort of uh, the dresses and foxes' heads and everything and we suddenly started getting a picture in the paper, you know. The first gig I remember of that tour was actually in a boxing ring in Dublin. Um, it's not the sort of place one would normally expect to go and perform in uh, in a red dress, but um, it was. Uh, I remember just the moment when I walked out uh, with this costume on, and there was uh, a real sense of shock and uh, horror in the audience, and, and I thought, "Oh, this is good." <laughs> Try a bit more of this. In order to get the kind of variety of sound we were looking for, it used to take us a very long time to set up between songs. And so we used to, when we first went on stage, we had these sort of embarrassed silences. And I used to go crazy because everyone would look at me as the front man in these long pauses while these guitarists were sort of endlessly twiddling their uh, tuning devices. So he'd start to tell stories, you know, which sometimes are totally irrelevant to the song. Within seconds, the entire clean, green, smooth surface of the park was a mass of dirty, brown, writhing objects. Old Michael continued to rub his flesh into the ground. This time he looked even happier and he whistled a little tune. It went like this. Faster, Phil. Amen. To us was perhaps Jerusalem boogie, but to the birds it meant supper is ready. Sitting beside you, I look into your eyes as the sound of motor cars. Fades in the night time I swear I saw your face change It didn't seem quite right Quite often when you're playing in a university bar They have not the slightest interest in what these musicians are doing up on the stage So somehow you, you've got to get their attention and, uh, and hold it Don't you know our love is true? Our production budget was about Twenty pounds a year, so it was very limited as to what he could do. A flower. I think the flower mask had come from um, watching Bill and Ben, the flower pot men, when I was a kid, and um, Willow Farm, which was uh, in the. Uh, Center of Supper's Ready was somewhere where I just tried to explore this unreal world of English subconscious. Supper's Ready was extremely important to the band because, in a way, that was a sort of centerpiece for our, our ambitions in terms of writing. Because 
you know, whatever else was going on in the visual department, our central interest was always and probably is still the writing, the composition of the music. And that was the most adventurous piece to date. All time! Feel your body melt. take you a little further westward, agriculturally speaking, to where the sweet smell of freshly mown grass pervades our hairy nostrils. <laughs> Snapping off time for the cosmic lawnmower. The band consolidated their reputation with the release of the lyrical album Selling England by the Pound. A single from the album, I Know What I Like, reached number 17 in the charts, and at last, Genesis seemed to be balancing creative innovation and commercial success. It's one o'clock, time for lunch, fandy damny day. When the sun beats down and I lie on the bench, I can always hear them talk. There's always been a story. The sense of humour in Genesis was extremely important, particularly to me and, and I think Phil in some ways, but the tracks Willow Farm and Supper's Ready and Harold the Barrel, um, I think we're trying to follow the tradition of, of English absurdist humour. I like too there was this sense again of looking at this of repression in the English psyche and uh, in the line you know me I'm just a lawnmower there's a sense of this guy you know, grabbing hold of this lawnmower and mowing the hell out of the grass <laughs> And it's surreal. Right from the moment where it starts off, where Pete's singing unaccompanied. Cried the uniform to his true love's eyes. It lies with me, cried the queen of maybe. For her merchant eyes, he traded in his prize. The influence for that was um, the Labour Party manifesto at the time, which was selling them by the pound. And, you know, it was the, the references are so scattered uh, within that one album and everything, including the album cover painted by a lady called Betty Swanick, who just died recently. Um, there was something about the whole kind of package that always makes me smile. Selling England by the pound Citizens of hope and glory, time goes by, it's the time of your life. Easy now, sit you down, chewing through their wimpy dreams, they eat without a sound. Let's 
Kinds of things come back when you say Land Lies Down Broadway. We did about 98 shows with it all the way across the world. We went to America before the double album had come out. Suicide, we played the whole thing to an audience of people who thought, what the hell's going on? Because Peter was dressing up in extraordinary, extraordinary costumes at this point. I cringe at certain places now when I look back at it. Again, atmospheres were caught in in some of the tracks. Something's changed. That's not your face. It's mine. We had these sort of um, slides behind us. We had three, you know, a triple screen system of slides, which are about a thousand slides, and they changed throughout the show. We did about 100 shows of, of Lamb Eyes Down. And I'd say it probably only all worked. Well, it never all worked, actually. It came close to all working on about four or five occasions, and they were great. Unfortunately, every other night there was always something wrong. At the end of The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, it used to have a little flash and Peter used to appear one side of the stage because the whole thing's about a split personality going. So Peter was on one side and the dummy, dressed the same as Peter, was the other side. And so there was this flash and the strobe would start and you weren't quite sure which one was real, you know? Anyway, it was the first gig in Europe and the mixture of flash powder for ratio to explosion was the first time this guy had done it. And uh, he got too much bang and not enough flash. <laughs> and the most deafening explosion. We just stopped playing. You know, we just looked around at each other and the audience was stunned. This guy poked his head around the curtain and said, sorry! <laughs> and I shouted out, you're fired! End of that tour, uh, suddenly, the lights go up and there's Pete on one stage singing and he panned to the other side of the stage. <laughs> there's a completely naked, big, fat Rudy. <laughs> Jeff Banks, on the He's still with us now. <laughs> I think it kind of culminated, the, for me personally, in the Slipperman costume, though, because at that point, like, I was very much, a, you know, a musician in this band, and I, you know, and this Yours. was this was starting to piss me off a bit <laughs> because I didn't. Peter was wasn't able to get a microphone close enough to his mouth half the time in that costume to actually do what he was supposed to be doing, which was singing. You know, there's all this big time stuff happening with sort of long tours being planned way in the future, um, and I just felt I was getting to be part of a machine, and I also, you know, felt I was becoming a sort of stereotype sort of rock star or falling into wanting that ego gratification and you know I, I didn't like myself I didn't like the situation then and I didn't feel free was very sort of hot as a director at that time, just after The Exorcist had come out. And he'd read this little um, story idea on the back of a live album. And liked that and wanted me as a sort of story ideas person for a film project he was trying to do. It was an opportunity he felt he couldn't turn down. And at the time, it just wasn't wrong for us to, to, to allow people to do things like that, you know. It just would have been totally wrong. Uh, I felt that quite strongly. My first daughter had just been born and for a while they didn't think she was going to survive. And it was during the making of the land when the band were in Wales and I was doing these crazy sort of five-hour drives through the night, um, thinking my Hillman imp. And it was sort of a, through these... Uh, I don't know, it was just... I was getting totally exhausted. But for me there was no question about priorities. And that, I think, pissed off the band too because... I was the first to sort of have a baby, and they, you know, didn't uh, have any understanding how it uh, changes the way you feel. You know, he grew up perhaps quicker than the rest of us, really, in a sense, in that, at that time, and he wanted a bit more time than we could, we felt we could give. The rest of us were totally committed to it, and so he, he felt he had to leave. You know, I had long talks with him about it because obviously we were we came into the group as sort of like best friends and everything, and uh, and him leaving was a, was a was a big blow to me personally. His last gig with the band was in um, was in. Besançon in France 
and it was supposed to be Toulouse, but because of lack of interest, there were no tickets had been sold. So the concert was cancelled, and we went. We were backstage at the dressing room in Toulouse, in, in Bessasson, and someone said, we're not playing tomorrow night, so this is the last night. And it was a terribly anticlimactic, because we, we all built up to this last night with Peter, that it was going to be a great show, and then suddenly there was, this was going to be the last night, and we weren't prepared for it. So he played the last post on the oboe, and we went on, play, on stage and did the lamb. Extraordinary, really. Gabriel's successful solo career has been a unique musical exploration. Influenced by American soul and the diverse sounds of African and Latin music, he has become an influential figure in the spread of world sounds. In 1986, he set up Real World Studios, which houses WOMAD, the world of music, arts and dance, an organisation that promotes multicultural arts in the West. I think the fact of him coming back into Genesis, which I get, I get asked daily when I'm on the road especially, no, I don't think that will ever happen. Um, we could get together for a special one-off, but, um, but we haven't and we're not. Gabriel did rejoin Genesis on one occasion at a special fundraising show for WOMAD at Milton Keynes. In 1982, Gabriel had helped organise the first WOMAD festival at Shepton Mallet with musicians and dancers from 25 countries. It was a critical and artistic success, but a financial disaster. It looked as if we were going to go bankrupt. It was a lot of pressure. I had sort of threats against my life and... Um, you know, people, really nasty phone calls to the, to the family, and it was just a horrible experience. Tony and the, and the band then really uh, proposed this thing to bail me out, so it was a very generous thing, and uh, although, you know, I had no wish really to relive my past or go backwards with Genesis, I was really uh, touched that they were prepared to um, help out. It's been a long, long time It rained all day long. Actually, my memories about that day are very vague because it was a little bit of a sort of a dream. We hadn't rehearsed enough for the show, for the show really. And uh, I think Pete came on in a coffin, if I remember. But he wasn't wearing a dress. That much I know. I'm actually very pleased we never recorded it or filmed it because I think for those that were there, it was a great, great evening. But to actually watch it back in the cold light of day, I'm sure the rough edges and wrong notes and dodgy bits. It was just a big mud bath out there, but I think the uh, audience were sort of wallowing nostalgia in the same way that we were. So it was um, musically not as strong as, as I'd hoped it might be. Uh, didn't quite grab the magic. Um, uh, but it was still very friendly. Uh, so reunion. Despite his personal solo success, fans around the world still hope that Gabriel will return to the fold and rejoin Genesis. transitional in, in the way, kind of reshuffle, different people writing, and uh, 
I think what I remember about that is going, in, going into Trick of the Tale, which is the first one without Peter, slightly apprehensive. Because we all thought, well, we felt confident, we thought we were going to, but there was a question mark there, you know, as to how, we, how the writing would go. It seems so obvious now, doesn't it? You know, you had a singer in the group and everything already. But, you know, I mean, we got Peter had all sorts of things that sort of came with him, and the, it was just like thinking of Phil. I don't know, I mean, I, I wasn't sh- sure. Phil always had a lovely voice for sort of soft stuff, but he had no, no ability, no, at the time he'd never sung anything hard at all. You know, we had no idea how he'd cope with a hard song. Right? <laughs> I was the last person that anybody thought I was going to sing. I've, I'd always been singing with the band and I'd always done the backups on the albums. I've always felt the singer was the cheapest gig in the band because all they had to do was look good and wiggle their bum. That's, that's the way I used to look at singers. And so I never wanted to be a singer. I always wanted the most respectable gig in the group, which was, of course, the drummer. You know. I felt that the drummer was the goalkeeper of the group. It was, uh, you could have a, a bad band with a good drummer and it would still sound good. So when, um, when you left and we started to get the singers down, I used to stand there and teach them the melody, you know. We used to audition these people every Monday for I don't know how many weeks. It felt like an eternity. And then my first wife at the time, you know, she said, uh, why, don't you go do, why don't you become the singer? And that, the thought horrified me of coming out from behind the drum kit, you know, and wiggling my bum and sort of doing everything that I said I wouldn't do. So anyway, I suggested this to Tony and Mike and they and Steve and they su- they were very surprised at my suggestion and they also were a bit dubious as to whether I'd better carry it off or not. The path is clear Don't know eyes to see The course lay down long before and so we got to men Remain inside their bed Though many times They've seen the way They leave He rides majestic Past worlds of men Who cannot Against the joy the, the first gig was strange because I've been used so used to just looking up and seeing Peter there and I got a certain confidence of seeing you Peter. You had to look around. down then, didn't you? <laughs> you had to feel like I was looking down, you're right. And it just looked, seemed so funny. But and it also, you just didn't know really how the audience were going to react because you thought that they were going to miss him and everything, uh, miss Peter, I mean. And uh, it was very strange about halfway through the show, I suddenly realised this was going to work. I mean, he had his own approach to the audience, but they, they sort of seemed to like him, you know, sure. which was curious, you know. <laughs> well, it's, Maybe you, you talk about it in third person, actually, just sitting here. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, I, I remember that very, I mean, London, Ontario was the yeah. gig, and I, and I just remember being more worried about what I was going to say to the audience than anything else, because Peter, what did, Peter did have was a communication. And uh, although it was, a, as it was more of a mysterious traveller than a bloke next door or a mate, he did communicate with an audience, and I thought that was very important, so I was more concerned about that aspect of it working than actually singing the song. We're going to try, together, all of us, to levitate the entire Wembley Stadium complex. Everybody hands in the air. 
Now the next thing is everybody go with me. Come on, come on. I think I felt something moving. Yes, I think something's happening. I think because the because Phil had come from within the group, I think people were very forgiving. And also, if I, I think musically, the band sounded better than ever. Angels never know it's time to close the book and gracefully decline. The song has found a tale. My, what a jealous fool is she. The face in the water looks up. She shakes her head as if to say that the blue girls have all gone away. Although they're rarely in the hip parade, Genesis are a supergroup, one of perhaps five groups in the world that always sell out, one of the few bands that can even fill the huge American halls. The millions of fans are there for more than just the sound. 200 jumbo jet lights change exactly to the music. The special effects would make a Hollywood mogul proud. The amplifiers are loud enough to drive 10,000 neighbors wild. In America, it was rather difficult because we had a biggish show, so we happened to play sort of fairly biggish places, but getting tiny audiences in them, and of course that's a recipe for disaster. You're losing money left, right and centre. You might not have heard of them, but they have a massive following among the young that take rock music seriously. There was the one year, though, that, that uh, we found out afterwards that one of our 19-year-old road managers was managing us for a year, and we spent everything we'd earned, but of course he hadn't kept any receipts, and so... That was quite a big blow. Adrian? Imagine approaching the tax man after a US tour that lost a fortune, you know, genuinely, but obviously did earn quite a lot at the same time. And he had a couple of garage seats and <laughs> one hotel. Looking for someone. Tony Smith promoted the band's first major tour in 1973. He uncovered the extent of their financial and technical disarray. <laughs> first date was in Glasgow. And we, I arrived up in Glasgow. <clears throat> to see them and uh, total chaos on the stage, absolute chaos. And uh, finally, we had to cancel the show because they had something like 400 volts of electricity running through every single piece of equipment on the stage. Couldn't, just could not walk on the stage. And I had to cancel the show in Glasgow, which is not the easiest of places to cancel shows. Do you want to go on the bus, or are you going to go? You going to go to the Mayfair and pick up the bus, no. or are you going to drive all the way out there? <laughs> I mean, yeah. the Mayfair is very nice. Yes, it may be, but uh, <laughs> drive a little London. quicker than your bus can. Drive all the way to London. To the traffic. It's, it's very nice. So, Pretty. Let's start. No, it will. Towards the end of the tour, they came to me and said, "Well, you know, you're saying we should get a manager. Why don't you do it?" So I, I said, "Okay." And that's when my trouble started. Right. So, well, as long as it all, I mean, I'm, no, I'm not being argumentative. No, no, I'm just saying there's no point in, in, us, in, sake, in, in us being there. If, if we have to do something, then we have to make sure we're there in time to do it. We've always argued and discussed, and that's why you're in a group. And if you don't like that, you leave groups. Um, Peter left. 
and Steve left for different reasons. It was funny because he just didn't turn up one day um, when we were doing the mixing of um, Seconds Out, I suppose it was. Yes, the live album, you know. So he didn't turn up, so we mixed him out of the rest of the album, and that was it, really. No, he, he just, I don't know, it's a, I wasn't really expecting it, actually. I was kind of surprised because on Wind and Wuthering, I felt he did the, some of the best writing contribution he'd ever done for us. I managed to let off steam by doing a solo album, which was successful. And it created a difficult situation within the band because the band perceived it as a threat. So there was pressure on me uh, to give up um, the solo career. Um, and I said, fine, OK, um, provided a, p a percentage of, of what I do is done by the band. And the band said, well, we don't really do things like that. We do it by committee. So it was a very difficult decision. And um, it took me over two years of agonising about that decision, but I felt um, I felt that the, the band was no longer a, a, a healthy musical climate for me. I always felt that Steve's strong point was as a guitarist. Strongest point, I think, more than as a writer. And I don't know if he ever really could see it that way in a sense, but I mean, he had some very original sounds and uh, original way of playing.